You are welcome to the Nigerian Filmmaker, a podcast about Nigerian filmmakers, their films, and how we can build a diverse and functional industry. I'm your host, Seleb Gott. On this episode, my guest is Chima Tempo Adigije. He is an art director and a production designer. He has worked on projects like Lost Cafe, Crime and Justice, and Eagle's Wings. We talk about the job of a production designer, his most technically challenging job, and the pervasive disrespect of the production designer's craft. If you're a new listener, you're welcome and I hope you enjoy. Hi Chima, you're welcome to the Niger Filmmaker. Yeah, thank you very much. It's my pleasure. Okay, so um, can you introduce yourself? My name is um, Chima Temple Adigije. Um, I'm a production designer. And I also work as an art director in the movie and television industry. Yeah, can you tell us, you know, your origin story in the industry? Yeah, it's uh, it's quite a long story actually. Um, well, I'll try as much as possible to make it short. Um, I actually started my career as uh, as a trainee editor, you know, in in Lagos because I was born and brought up in Lagos. So at some point, I felt like I was doing some linear jobs after my school. So I felt like it was time for me to pick up, you know, a career for myself, you know, and something that could also put food on the table. Yeah. I think at that moment, you know, my family was struggling a little bit, you know, in finance because um, my dad lost the site. So, so he decided to move out of Lagos, you know. So I think that's what started everything. So I felt like as a man, I need to, my dad has done his part and he's, you know, he was actually aging at that particular time. So I felt like, you know, this is the time for me to also start thinking like a man. So I decided to, you know, go into the into the entertainment world. So I got contact with, um, my mom knew a, a then famous, you know, music video director. Mm. Um Uzodima Okechi by name. So, you know, so, um, yeah, so my mom just put the call through to the mom, to his own mom. So the mom said, okay, no problem. I'm, I'm, you know, I will talk to my son. And if he says yes, he'll come over. So we waited for like a week. Then, you know, to cut it long story short, I met him. So he invited me over to um, the studio. That's the House of Macro, mm. House of Macro, you know, productions uh, in somewhere around Shita in Sule, Lagos. So when I got there, you know, he introduced me to um, the proprietor, um, Simiso Kwe Olua. Then, you know, so they said, okay, that I was going to be on probation, kind of. So that was how I started with them, you know. So I had like a one-year spell, you know, as, um, as a trainee, editor, special effects. Then the following year, I was supposed to be staffed, but um, they said I wasn't ready, you know, that I still needed more time. So, yeah. and, you know, yeah. So what happened at that particular time was like, I needed money. So I was patient enough to run the one year, you know. So now, you, you, now you're telling me to run another year, you know. So for me, it didn't go that well because... I felt, look, after that one year, I could be making money and also support the family, you know, the, no more father, nothing. So so I decided to take, you know, a different, you know, path again. I got into the Navy. Um, I felt like, you know, this wasn't uh, what my heart wanted, you know. So yeah. I was just a very young guy, you know, at that particular time, you know, searching for, searching for a career. I wasn't really searching for money, money, but at the same time, I needed to do something that could fetch money for me, you know, and the family. So, uh, so, and, you know, as a young guy, you know, like I said, I I needed money at the same time. So I felt like, you know, th- this and everything, is, you know, wasn't my calling, you know. So I needed to be in the entertainment world, you know. So I told my mom one, one faithful day, I was supposed to go to Port Harcourt for, for like six month training kind of uh, program. So I, I just woke up one morning and I said, I'm not going anywhere and I don't want to be in the Navy anymore. So my mom was so, 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 so disappointed. So at some point she said she was going to like, you know, 
<laughs> disown me. Mm. Yeah, so at that point, you know, like she knew, she saw that I was really serious because all those were, all, all the way she was saying that she thought I was joking. So when she now knew I was serious, so, you know, so my relationship with her not sad for like one month. Then I think my my brother, uh, rest in peace, um, you know, called, called me up and said, okay, now you're in Lagos, you're not doing anything. And there was no way I could go back to the studio anymore because I had already signed off. So... So he said, now you're in the studio, you're not you're, now you're in Lagos, you're not doing anything. Why don't you come join me in Abuja? Let me see if I can get you a job, you know, in the bank or something like that. So okay, no problem. That's a good plan. You know, so I told my mom, my mom didn't respond. She didn't even say anything. She wasn't in support of anything, like she just didn't want to, you know, <laughs> attend to me again. Yeah. So I found my way down to Abuja. You know, I had to raise money. I found my way down to Abuja. I met my brother. So my brother got me a job in the bank as a driver because there was no other position again so i think it was the then citizen bank or something like that you know so to cut the long story short i told him that i wouldn't want to do that so he said oh really that he knows the he knows the bank the bank the branch manager and if i do if i go in as um as 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 um as a driver that maybe after a year or two they will change my position and so I dressed up, I ironed my clothes, you know, he talked me into it. So in my head, that wasn't still what I wanted, you know. Yeah. So the, the salary was very lucrative, you know. So I ironed my clothes, I did everything, you know. I woke up 6.30 the next day and I changed my mind. And he was like, really? Like, really? I said, he, he said, okay, no wonder. Now he can see what my mom saw. Hmm. you know that it's, it's like i don't want to be responsible in the, in this life you understand it's like you know so he started using some you know harsh words on me you know telling me how i want to be irresponsible you know how i want to be you know i'm just unnecessarily stubborn and i, I it's like I, I just want to be useless in life you know so i you know i accepted all that i didn't respond back so so you understand that was i started staying at home you know doing nothing Sometimes I'll wake up in the morning, I'll go out to see if I can get something, you know, just to get small money because he wasn't feeding me because he yeah. felt like, okay, if I punish you here, then you, you will know what you've done to yourself, you know, son. Well, you know, I took it with good faith, you know, son. So I started, every morning I go out every day, you know, I go to see if I can get a site, you know, just do one small job and just make, get money and buy small food for myself, mm. you know, so... To call it long story short, so one fateful day, you know, I was outside ready to go out, you know, for job job hunting. Then I saw I saw buses like more than more than seven to eight, ten thereabouts, you know, uh, what do you say, highest buses, you know, drove past. And at that, I think um, it was a dusty road. I remember, so I think our house was the last house on the um, in the estate. So our, our path was not tired. So the yeah. dust was so much that early morning that I didn't even see much. I, I just saw, you know, headlamps. Like, you know, so I couldn't see anything. So I didn't say, you know, I went back home. The following day, I had vroom, vroom, vroom again, like 6, 30 a.m. You know, I rushed out again. And I said, ah, what's going on here? Then I called the megad and I said, they said, ah, na 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 so then they pass here every day, every morning. They will soon pass again, you know. That's like, I said, who are these people? They said, they are white people. I said, white people from where? What are they doing here? Say they're just like a couple of white guys, like lots of them mixed with blacks. I said, oh, okay. I don't know, but let me trace them, you know. Let me trace where those buses were going. So that was like, you know, I, that faithful morning. And that kind of seven, the day was just about to kick start. So I went straight. I traced their path. And I discovered that they were actually working on a, 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 a fame lot. Yeah. Like, like like three to four hectares of land. You understand? So I, yeah, so I, 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 you know, I went into the lot with, you know, I was, I went past the small gates. So when I got there, I saw them, you know, I, then they just came in briefly and they were going out again. So when I walked in there straight up, I, I met a, a man there, an elderly man and um, customer by name. So I, I told him, I said, ah, sir, sorry, please, what's happening here? He said, ah, who allowed me in? <laughs> I said, okay, sorry, sorry, should I go out? He said, no, 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 what, what do you want? I said, okay, please, sir. Um, I hear that these people are here for something. So please, what's going on here? So he now explained everything to me. He said, these people are actually from, that they are from BBC, BBC World Service Trust. Yeah. You know, um, no, yes, BBC World Service Trust. 
yeah, yes. So now is media action. Then it was World Service Trust. So he said there are you know crew from London who have come to Nigeria to come and train up, do hands on with um, the young young filmmakers in Nigeria and train them up. You know on a TV series. Then they will leave. You know, so they will now take over. And they've gone to the National Film Institute NFI to go and fetch, you know, some young, young, brilliant students to train up, you yeah. understand? So I'm like, wow, really? Uh, so instantly it clicked, you understand? So even me, I knew that I think this is where I've always wanted to be, you know? Like I said, yes, now I think I have it, you know? So I started thinking of how to approach him, you know, to build a career here straight up. So I, I told him, so I said, I'm a trainee editor, please, can I, is there any how you can help me, sir, please? He said, okay, no problem. Uh, that um, what he's going to do is um, that I will come back the next day, that he will put one or two words through, you know, then he will give me feedback. I said, okay, the next day I went there, you know, so he said um, actually that they said that they've taken, uh, uh, that that position is occupied. So I was so, so disappointed. I didn't know what to do. I was very, very, for the first time, like I felt like, you know, like I've missed the greatest opportunity ever. And this is what I've always wanted to, this is the industry I want to dwell in. Yeah. You know, so I, as I was going, he called me back. He saw this appointed me and he said, oh, would you work in my own department? I said, what's your department, sir? He said, ah, we, we are the art team. I said, what does art team do? You know, and so it was like, okay, he explained a few to me. And he said, oh, if you can work, you know, me, I can, you know, just put you in my team. You know, you can just be doing one or two things, you know, instead of sitting down at home. So I told him, thank you. That's exactly what I want. I don't have a problem with that, sir. So he said, he promised me, he said, along the line, he would take me back to the editing, you know, department. I said, okay, no problem. So he said, oh, if I'm okay with it, that's me, I'm not going to be any money. My, my name is not going to be on the payroll. I said, no problem, sir. This is, I want it, sir. He said, okay, no problem. Come the next day. So I went there the next day. I kicked up. I ironed my clothes. You know, I was, I ironed my t-shirt. I put on my tie. Hmm. You know, I wore my shoe, you know. So I was looking very, very, very clean. I wore my best clothes, my best t-shirts, you know. Yeah. So I, I I I walked in there the next day. So he saw me. He said, "Ah, hello, who are you?" I said, "Ah, sir, I'm the one, sir." He said, "Oh, really?" He said, "Were you the one that came yesterday?" I said, "Yes, sir." He said, "Oh, sorry, oh, I think you might have to go back home." Oh. Um, you know, I told you before now that that I said, "But you talked about me being in your team." He said, eh, "But you can't walk with us." Now I said, "Why?" He said, "The way you're dressed, you can see me, see everybody." So I don't think you are. I, I think you are an office office person. So I don't think you can, you know, work with us to be frank with you. It's not as if I'm, I'm not chasing you, but you can't work here. I said, ah, sir, what's the problem? Just let me know now. He said, no, that he just advised me. Why don't you just wait? If there is opening in the edit, editing, you know, department, then I will let you know the editor's side. Yes. So I said, sir, is it my dressing? He said, yes, now that day they don't dress like this. Then as he was talking, I was pulling off my shoes. As I was talking, I was rolling my sleeve. Yeah. I think I removed my sleeve completely. So it was my, you know, my singlets. Then I rolled up my 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 trousers. So he he looked at me and smiled and said, Now you're ready. <laughs> you know. So uh -huh. I said, Thank you, sir. <laughs> so he now took me straight up to where the painters were painting because it was like a film lot. So the, the everywhere was really crazy. The carpenters were really working. So it was like a complete, you know, um, film village, you understand? So where, all, and they were using concrete in some places, then flat in some places, they built hospitals, yeah. they built, you know, yeah, you know, everywhere, you know? So they built police station, they built club, they built cafe, they built everything, literally everything in there. So that was how I got in there, you know, in there. And then I started working with the painters and from there, so, <laughs> That's how my career started, actually. So when you joined them, was that the training or they had already started shooting? No, they were still, you know, on pre-production. So when I joined them, so, and this is where, I think this that's just the turning point for me because when I joined them, I was with the painters. The following week, he would call me to go and join the carpenters. I would go and join the carpenters. So I started learning. I started learning the language. Yeah. Started learning, you know, everything there. So another day he would tell me to go and join the welders. Sometimes he would tell me to go and get food for everyone, you know. So I was like, you know, I was like the boy in the middle of men. So, yeah. so you know, so then all the the you know like the 
the, the, the white guys, when they come in, they will see me, you know, just everywhere. You know, when they go here, I'm here. When they go there, I'm there. You know, so I think that continued for like for like three weeks or there about. So they started making an inquiry about me, like, who is this guy? You know, so for me, it was like the turning point, you understand? So it was like, who is this guy? We want to know this guy. Like, so every time they call him, they ask him a question about me. Like, who is this guy? Like, I see him running up and down. He's here painting. He's there doing this one. He's carrying wood, you know. We want to know this guy, you know. So I felt like, you know, he, he had also established a very sweet relationship with me. And he loved me, you know, to be, to be frank. So mm. he wanted me to remain in his department. So he didn't want a situation where they would pick me up and I would not be there anymore. So I was so, so useful. Yeah. And I was very, very hardworking, you understand? So I think that was what he was trying to protect. So he he was hiding that, you know. So so you know along the line, the shoot started proper, you know. So we started, you know, talking. I started making friends, you know, with the guys from the National Film Institute. Started making friends. So those ones, at some point, you know, they all liked me, you know. So they they started, you know, asking me questions about how much do you earn, what's going on in your department, who are you, where are you from, do you have a contract. Yeah. No, you don't have a contract. Why don't you have a contract? You know, so many questions started going on. So at some point, I was forced to respond to them, and they were very, very pissed. Like I, I really, you don't have a contract here. So what are you doing here? You know, for like two, three months, you're here. You know, and it was like forty-eight episodes. You know, uh, they started talking about it. So it got to the white people's ear. It got to the production manager's ear. It got to the lines producer's ear. You know, yeah. so they were like, who? We've been asking this question for so long. Who is this guy that we don't know? And this guy works so hard, you know? So they called me up and, you know, they invited me to the office and, and I, I told them everything. I like, okay, I'm just a guy here working, you know, I get money at the end of the day, you know, from this guy, you know? So they were like, really? I said, how much do you get? I told them and they were very pissed. They said, no, this is not going to happen. You understand? So that was how they gave me a contract. So when they gave me the contract, the production guy, um, the production designer felt like I'd snitched in. You know, you understand what I'm saying? Yeah. So he didn't enjoy that. You understand? So, so that's like a different story, actually. So I think that that was how I got my first contract with BBC, and so the training went on and on and on and on until the production designer, at some point, you know, was sacked. You know, so they were like asking me if I, I, you know. If I fancy, mm. <laughs> if I fancy taking up, you know, the role to, you know, guys. So it's like, you know, to me, it's like the story of Joseph yeah. in the Bible. Yeah. You understand? So me, I was like, really, why, why me? You know, like I met guys here now. So why me? So they saw how, you know, how, you know, how hardworking I was, and they felt like you are just the person we need. So at that point, I told them no, and they were like, really? Do you know how much you be earning? Like when you, you just say yes. So the guys. My friends then were very, very pissed. You know, they said, why didn't you just say yes? Don't worry, you will cope. I said, but I don't know anything about production designer. I'm not a production designer. I don't know anything. I don't even know what that means. You know, yeah. so how do you expect me to pick up a job like that? You understand? So they said, but you've been working here. I said, then it's different. I understand? So, you know, I had that little banter with my friends. So at some point, you know, they said, okay, they hired another production designer. But when they hired that one, that one worked like for a few months, you know, he was fired again, you know. So they approached me again. I told them, I, I, I said no again. I rejected it. Mm. So luckily it was me like three months, you know, before the whole thing. So we worked without an art director, basically, you know, for that three months. So the project expired, like after two years. So at some point, you know, they sent me to National Film Institute, you know, to pick up, you know, one course, you know. So I did production, under production design, you know. So this was how they now gave me a contract of an art director so we did you know a couple of you know you know one-offs with yeah. them then i went out worked as an art director so after then you know so this is my story so then there is this another part of the story where i traveled to nairobi kenya okay. for a hands-on you know for a master class as a production you know um production under production designer um under production design um a workshop yeah yeah okay so can you break break it down to us what does a production designer do yeah um interesting question um it's uh production 
production a production designer is one who is responsible like in a very in the layman's you know world a production designer is one who is responsible for every tangible thing and in and in, in the story mm. so it means like like he's responsible for how the characters look he's responsible for where the characters live he's responsible for what they do what they eat you know where they go to but surely he's not responsible for how they act and how they react yeah. to situations so just basically the tangible things around a particular character the world of a character the world surrounding the character and the people who are also related to the character yeah the production designer is responsible for every tangible thing around the characters so that's like you know a def- that's like a very simple definition so when you go more into details you can now say that the production designer is one that uses color to stimulate mood in the minds of the audience so it means like for every color that you see, every color on the costume, every color in the living room, every color around the world of a particular character is the production designer that has made that happen. Yeah. So in another definition, you can also say that the production designer is someone who services the director's vision. So what this means is the director has the vision to build a world that never existed. So this is where the production designer comes in to help build the world that people can see, people can relate with. Okay. How different is the work of an art director to that of the production designer? So the, it's, it's quite different. Like it's not even to be compared, but even though there are similarities. So, and the reason why there are similarities is because uh, most production designers work as art director. Yeah. And most art directors also work as production designer. So and that's why, you know, so because, you know, like before you can be a production designer in my head, I feel like you have to become an art director. You have to go through the ranks yeah. before you can become a good production. So if you watch most of the production designers, the sound production designer in the world, even in Hollywood and Bollywood, you will discover that these people actually started as a PA in the art department. Yeah. Some of them started as a construction man. Some of them started as, you know, you know, a, a production a, 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 a department coordinator, you know. So so you have to be in the system. You have to know how it works, you know. So it's difficult to just go and study production design and become a production designer. Yeah. That, that's like one of the most difficult things you can ever do to yourself. Why is it difficult? So, it's difficult because you need the experience on set. It it involves administration. It's not just about designing a beautiful set. So that's also another. That's to me. I feel like that's also another. You know, and um, thing that people get wrong. So there is these people they call set designers. Yeah. They are not necessarily production designers. So you can be a good set design. There's, you can be a good set designer, but you are not up to, you're not qualified to be called a production designer because production designer, the, the work of a production designer is very, very broad. It's very, very wide. Yeah. So he oversees a lot. He oversees the costume department. He oversees wardrobe, like I said. He oversees location scouting. Mm. He oversees the makeup, hair. He oversees sometimes the 80s he oversees um he oversees a um, special effects you know editor yeah. you understand so it's very 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 broad so you have to be very very extremely sound so if you go to the school which is good and study production design you still have to come and experience how the art department is being run day to day all right, so at this point, can you mention three random facts about yourself? Based on what I do or my Based life? Based on also? your life or what you do. Just three random things that, you know. Okay, yes. facts about myself. I, I think I'm a very realistic person. And and I think I have um, I have 
great eyes for aesthetics. And I think I know how to tell story. Okay. So these three things are things are, are elements that has also helped me, you know, growing up. You know, like I said, you can see from my story how I grew up through the ranks, yeah. you know, from zero level to the highest level. You mm. understand? So, and I'm grateful to God. It's not by my power. And to me, I think I like to be realistic. And I think I have great eyes for aesthetics. And and I think I, you know, I know how to tell a story. Yeah. So, yes. So those are my strong attrib attributes. Okay. So like apart from you know your practical experience on sets, how did you like hone this um eye for great aesthetics? Okay, that's a very interesting question, and uh, I think uh, this this I don't know I, in my head I feel like you know I've I think I grew up you know knowing that one day someone will ask me this question you know uh -huh. on air so yeah it's very very interesting yeah honestly and I already have the answer. Okay. So I think uh, there are things like, you know, things we do and we succeed, but yeah. we don't know how come. And I think some of these things that can, you know, be religious sometimes, you know, so sorry if I'm taking you there. Yeah. I think some of these things are, div are, are, div are divine, you know. So when you want to explain how, you know, you have these attributes, at the end of the day, you may be wrong. At the end of the day, you will discover that you see you yourself cannot even explain it. So it's like Cristiano Ronaldo in football. It's like you know Messi in football. Mm. It's like you understand. Know, so these people have speed. Yes, they have the agility. Yes, but are they the only one who have speed and agility? No, there are thousands of footballers too. You mm. Understand who have that same attribute that they have. So, but then at the end of the day, why is it that they are always at the right place? To put the ball at the back of the net they are always positioned to put the ball at the back of the net so i think some things are better left on you know it's unexplained because if you want to explain it you can even offend your creator mm. so to me i feel like for me not to be in the navy for me not to be in the bank i feel like you know something was calling and i think i have this divine you know thing in me that i feel like when i get into this field I am going to succeed. Yeah. You understand? So to have eye for aesthetics, you know, to see, I'm trying to see how I can also answer that question from another perspective. Yeah. To have eye for aesthetics, I think is something, is something, you know, you can, you know, you know, you can work on what's definitely going to take time. You know, it's not just something you can say, okay, let me just work on it for one, for one day. It's like, if you're a banker, and you resign from you know, your banking job, you want to become a production designer. Yeah. How? You understand? So it's not something you can just come, okay, one more, let me sit in the class for one year and learn. You understand? So that's what I'm saying. Sometimes, you know, you can't just get everything in the, in the film school. If you want to become a production designer, you need to have something in you that you can build on. And I think this is one of them. That like, This is something you must have. You understand? So, okay, now have you asked yourself, like, sometimes... Have you asked this question? Like sometimes you give birth to a child yeah. at age two and three. This guy is drawing very well. It's not every child that can do that. And you because I know I know of one very young, brilliant girl. Mm. She was like six years old. She can draw anything. Anything like imaginative drawing. She can draw it very, very well. You understand? So mm. So you can see that kind of person. And and she now picked interest in designing, you know, clothes, fashion, you know, all those kind of things. When you see her styling, you know, sometimes you'll be like, wow, how did you get this? So there was one her mom brought out one day and, and show me because she knew like I was into, you know, entertainment, you know, industry. So she showed me and said, see what my daughter drew. And I looked at it and I said, wow. So it looks like something like Kim Kardashian will put on. Yeah. You know, it was looking very, very cool. And I'm like, how did you learn? I was asking her, how did you? He said, nothing, you know, that is when she don't small. She don't the drum. So, you know, all these things started giving me, like, this answer to this question. Like, some things are just, like, divine attribute that you already have in you. So yeah. it's easy for you to build on it, yeah? Okay. So if you ask me to, you know, give advice, you know, to the young ones, like, how can they achieve 
you know, how can they, you know, have this, you know, active boots? To me, I think, you know, sometimes they say practice make perfect, you know, and sometimes when you do things over and over and over again and you fail so many times, yeah. you can also see yourself, you know, you know, becoming guru at that thing. So I think when you practice hard, if even if you don't have it, you know, in you, if you're not born with it, when you practice hard, I think you can also be a good production designer. Okay. You know, you mentioned that, you know, this is your first experience. You were sent to um, join the painters. You were also sent to the carpenters. Like, for an aspiring production designer going through the ranks of the, um, you know, the art departments, um, what are some practical skills that, you know, contribute to, um, you know, better understanding and progression in that department what are some practical skills yeah i think first of all is it's a difficult department to be in that's that's one thing i'm really going to state out clearly it's a difficult department you can never find a lazy person whoever works in the art department is not lazy you know it's very very difficult so having said that i feel like you must be you must be, you know, you must be agile and you must be fit. Yeah. You must be agile, you must be fit, you know, you must be hardworking, you know. So, like I said, you have eyes for aesthetics. That is even the most important one, like I I mentioned earlier on. Once you have the eyes for aesthetics, there are a lot of people who have super skilled, but they don't have the energy to be in, to, to do what, what you know they 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 know how to do best so i think it's just if a, a total package a total yeah. when i say total package it means like you have to you have to be you have to be agile you have to be dedicated you have to be hard working you don't have to put money first you have to try to build your career and in, in the in the art department you know so you know listening to my story story it tells a lot yeah. it just tells you all like you have to be patient and you have to try to learn. You keep learning. You know, you try it. You be patient. You keep learning. You have to be hardworking. You have to be agile. And you, you need to have, you know, eyes for aesthetics because that eyes for aesthetics is what will give you job in the future. That's what is going to fetch you and take you to the highest level that you can be in. So you can imagine me, for example, you know, you know, working as a liberal yeah you know in, in here so now i'm now a production designer for africa magic that so that's like you know the giants in africa yeah you understand so that's like giants so that tells a lot of story so it means like i might have dedicated a lot i might have committed myself i might have worked so hard then i must have eyes for aesthetics because that's what they require from you so no matter how hard working you are if you don't have that eyes for aesthetics you can't get to the heights you want to be. Yeah. Okay. Um. How about you know knowledge of technical drawing? So you know, um, translating let's say floor plant into like you know flats for um like in studio sets. Do you think that one is also helpful? Yes, super helpful. Yeah, super, super, super. So like you know, like most. Most guys, most production design, most successful production designers are usually, you know, architects. Yeah. You know, they are architects. They are, you know, they are painters. They are architects. They are, you know, um, graphic designers, you know. Yeah. So that gives them edge over every other person. So if you know how to do your technical drawing, if you know, in, if you are, you know, an architect definitely. You know, like it's like you're jumping like in like four stages. I don't know if you know what I'm saying. Yeah, I guess. yeah. So, yeah. so you're jumping like four stages. You know, ahead of everybody. So if an ordinary person and, and an architect starts, you know, because I remember growing up, I had some friends. Even when I went for a workshop in Kenya, yeah, I remember there were guys who who were act architects in my class. And, you know, I, I think their career now is so, so, so big. You know? So they ended up, you know, 
you know, becoming very successful, even more successful than I, you know. So yes, my my answer is yes. Okay. Um. So when you get a script, um, what's the first thing you do? Uh, the the first thing I do when I when I get the script is to um is to try to you know you know speak to the director. So the, the first thing I do, even before reading the script, is to also request for um, the character bible, you know. Then after going through the character bible, when I read the script the first time, then I I try to schedule a meeting with the director. So this helps me or gives me a better understanding of where of of the of his vision, you know, like and and the kind of project I'm going to be working on. So after having that first meeting with him, there's going to be a series of meetings anyway. So the first thing I do, you know, like I said, is to ask for the um, the, the character bible, you know, so I can understand the character. So instead, I read. Sometimes I read first, then I read the character bible, or I request for the character bible first yeah. and read the script. So after reading, is to the first thing, the, the, the next thing is to schedule a meeting with the director. You know, so it, sometimes it's virtual. Sometimes, I, some, most times, I prefer, you know, physical meeting with the director because it helps me, you know, to understand better his vision. Because right then, then we are going to be going through some pictures instantly. You understand? Yeah. We're going to be going through some pictures. We're going to be, I'm going to be doing some sketches, you know, on my part, you know. So we're going to be seeing you know, the vision right there and then. So when I now go back, I, when I now go back, I read for the second time, you know. So when I read for the second time, now it becomes, at that moment, it becomes very, very clear, you know, of the idea, you know, that the writers and the director wants to go with. Yeah. Then from there, you know, it becomes like now it's now up to me to start having my own input from there on. So it's, this is me now, you know, trying to advise, you know, even the director, you know, a different level entirely. Production designers, you know, are not to say yes to everything the director wants. Yeah. So if it's going to be a case of yes, 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 yes then I wonder what the production designer will be doing on set. And to me, I feel like materials are not to be given to production designers. So even if you receive materials, like some projects, they already have their mood board. Mm. Some projects, they already have their style of shoot. You know, they have their colors. They have their color palette. I feel like production designers, you know, shouldn't be the yeah, yes, yes, yes kind of person. Except, you know, it's really, really yes, yes. I don't know if you can understand what I'm saying. Yeah. Yes. So that's how I feel. So to me, I feel like after, you know, after reading the second time, then I start developing, you know, my own concepts. Then I try to compare with the, you know, with some movies that are shot, you know, in most times I use Hollywood, you know, I try to use, you know, the highest level yeah. to compare, you know, what I have developed, you know. Then I try to understand, I try to do research and see if it has been used before. Was it successful, you know, or was it not? Was it a failure, you know? When I design my concepts, then I request for the second meeting with director. Mm. So at this point, I'm not even talking to anybody. I'm not talking to, you know, my team. I'm not talking to the producer. I'm not talking to, I just want to talk to the director for the second time. Yeah. So... After talking to him with the, for the second time, he he likes all my ideas. You know, he doesn't like some. We talk about it. You know, I try to make him understand. Like, trust me on this one. This is how it should be. You know, like when he likes it, he buys some. He doesn't buy some. He makes me understand. I need to understand why you will not buy this. You know, yeah. because I've seen it work. I think this is how, the better way to tell Africa. Like, for example, it's an African story, which of course that's what I do. And I know I'm very 100% at it. So I make him to understand. I've worked with, you know, foreign directors who come into Nigeria, you know, like, so this is what I feel we should do. You understand? Mm -hmm. So we talk about it, you know, we go through it. 
he buys everything, he doesn't buy everything, it's fine. So at the end of the day, you what I'm trying to do is to service his vision. You understand? Mm -hmm. uh -huh. yeah. So so that's what I do when I receive the script. So after you know agreeing with the director, then what I now do now is to speak to my team, you know, at the same time speaking to production, speaking to producers, you know, telling them this is what I want to do, you know. So I speak to my team, I speak to the props person, I speak to the scouting, you know, team, you know. So we schedule, you know, scouting, you know, dates. I like to go out with them, you understand? So we go out, we scout even before the director. So I do that on his behalf. So when I go out with them, I take my own pictures, you know, I come back home, I try to place things and make it, and try to see if this is exactly what me and director has agreed on, you know? So, so when I see all these things and I feel like, okay, this could work, you know, but then I share everything I see on location with the director yeah. and the production team. And the reason why I share with production team is to know ahead if they can afford to repaint or to reconstruct this location. Yeah. And at the same time, speaking to the director to know if we can alter what we've agreed on, you know, or do you think this place can work? I know we've agreed on something else. Do you think this one can still work? You know, so there's so much, you know, interaction, you know, after then. So this is also one of the problems that I always have with somebody, you know, calling me for a project and say, Chima, how are you doing? What's up? Um, we have a job coming up. Okay. I want you to be the production designer. Okay. So the first question I ask is, when are you starting this job? And you're like, next tomorrow. Mm -hmm. Some we say next week. Some we say next month. Yeah. Some we say in two months time. Two months time is still not enough. You understand? So bring in a production designer. So look at all the process that I have mentioned earlier on. So, you know, how do you expect that to happen within two months? You understand? So not to not talk of a week, not to not talk of two days. Mm. You understand? So it's a challenge. So anyway, I think that's the question. You know, I, that's the answer to your question. So those are the things I do yeah. when I receive the things. Okay. So, you know, with productions, like, um, you know, different departments are trying to get, you know, extra money to kind of do things for um, yeah. how the film would look. With production design, you know, you have, you have um, you know, actual locations, you can you know build sets you can also build models and you can you know consider green screen for you um you know at what point do you start suggesting all these different you know potential solutions to capturing the certain locations that might be tricky to you know reconstruct or travel to Yes, I think um, it. I think it's um after um, you've you know submitted um your lookbook, you know after you submit it, so there is going to be you know you and the um and production team deliberating on your idea yeah. as per money, then you and the director deliberating on idea as per is it too elaborate or is not you know, so. After that deliberation, I think it will come to a point where you, it will now be like, okay, do you know what? We cannot travel to Sokoto to go and shoot Sokoto. Mm. So what do we do? I don't know if you get my point. Yeah. Yeah. So this is the point now where all these things will now start, will now start, you know, conceptualizing, trying to see, okay, how about if we get a studio? Okay, now the next question will now be to me. And the, the next question from production to me will now be, okay, let us know, let us see it. How is it going to look like? And how much will it cost us? Yeah. So this is where, you know, you start bringing more hands, you start doing, you know, visual um, illustration, uh, virtual illustration, you know, then you start trying to visualize things and, and drawings and everything, you know, showing them, you know. So I'm talking from Nollywood, you know, um, point of view. Yeah. Because of the kind of budget that we have, we usually run away from building. Mm. 
So we run away from, you know, construction because it costs a lot of money. It's not just the money for the materials, but also money to pay for a studio section. Mm. You know, so you can imagine paying two weeks for a studio section. So we normally do actual locations here and modify. So I'm talking from that angle. So if at the end of the day, we cannot find some locations, you know, then the next thing is to start thinking of, okay, all right, let's come up with the idea of building. All right, so let me give you a scenario. So um, you need to shoot a film set in the past. And, um, you know, I think with Nigeria, it might be generally difficult, you know, kind of to find props from, like, from, let's say, 1990 for you to achieve what the director wants. Like, what are some of the things you start doing? Are you looking to, is there somewhere, like, in Nigeria where you can always find all these old props or do you now start um you know trying to reconstruct stuff for you how are you going to approach that okay so that's like um it's like um it's very difficult um but that, that's not the most difficult you know um journey that you know production designers you know usually work on so but it's difficult because it has to do with um quite a lot of research. Mm. So your research, you know, engine has to be, you know, at its full capacity. So from morning to night to the following day, you're, you're, when you're working on the road, your research, you're thinking, you know, like, because these things are things that have existed in the past. Mm. Uh -huh. So you need to research them. So you are not making anything from your imagination. Yeah. So even though sometimes, yes, sir. So, but most times, like me, I try to stylize a little bit. So the, the first thing I do is to take permission from, from the product, from, um, you know, like from whoever, you know, gives you the first call. You understand? So is this, I understand where we're going with the story. I understand it's a period piece, but we still need to stylize a little bit. You understand? So, yeah. Yes. So if that is the case, then it helps me a lot because when I search for one or two things and I don't find it on the internet, or I don't find it anywhere in books or or anywhere, I stylize it straight up. So that's what I do. So what, so I come up with my own concept. I say, okay, why don't we make them have this kind of, you know, living room, you know? So when we look at it and we say, okay, fine. Yeah, I, I think we can, it can pass. You understand? So, yes, so that's basically how I approach, you know, period piece. So when I get the scripts, like the first thing I do is quite a lot of research. Like you keep researching, you don't stop researching, mm. you understand? Because you don't even know if what you're researching or if your results are real, are facts. Yeah. You understand? So, yeah, so you can, you know, because anybody can put anything up on the internet. So uh, you can go to the wrong sites and get the wrong thing. So there are a couple of times where, you know, you research, you feel like you're so much on point and you get on set and it's re and people are ready for the scene. And the next thing, when you bring out a particular prop and, you know, the, maybe, this, the, maybe the standby, you know, art director brings out this prop and people are like, no, no, you know, it has happened even in my career so many times. Like, yeah. no, this is not it. No, I, I, you know, like one elderly man amongst you can just say, no, no, no. I was born then. No, mm -hmm. we never had this. You know, yeah. so it happened when I was filming when I was on the set of Seventy Six. Yeah. That's with um, Izo Juku. Yes, so many times. Like, so because we used you know the military gadgets. So we had some old soldiers in our midst that would just pop up somewhere and say, "No, it wasn't like this." I'm sorry, you know. And you yeah. as a young boy, I was a young boy then, so you know. You know, so so that's why it, it, you need to keep researching. You just even when you research, you still make some phone calls. If you have an elderly someone in your family or in the village, you know, you keep sending pictures out and say, "Please help me confirm this." You know, mm. you know. So, so I think that's basically it. You just research. That's that's where you channel all the energies on research. Yeah. Yes, and and you know where it now gets worse is is um, the fact that we don't have a prop house. Yeah. We don't have a proper prop house in, in, in Nigeria. So that makes the whole thing so, so difficult. 
So what it means now, if, if you research all these things that you, you've done or whatever, you have to still go down to the locals and see how you can buy it off them. Mm. And most of these people, they cherish these things so much, they don't want to release. Mm. The highest thing they can do is to rent to you and you'll be shocked that the money you're going to use in renting that stuff can buy you a brand new one in today's market. Yeah. You know, yes. So that's how expensive it is to shoot a period piece. So, but I mean, the bottom line is you have to go to the locals. You have to go to your villages, call your uncles and make sure that this thing is on point. At least try to get someone who lived in the 1950s or in the 1960s that can understand what, you know, you're trying to get. Okay. Um, so you mentioned that um, period pieces are not the um, most difficult kind of genres to work on. Which one is it? I think the most difficult is um, is is um, um, futuristic. Okay. Yeah. So I think that's the most difficult. You know. So um, I don't know if anyone would want to disagree, but um, I think that's the most difficult because. This is a journey where everything is like we like in those days in my class, we call it the production designers movie. Yeah. Because everything is based on your imagination. Everything is based on your creativity. Everything is from you. Like nobody has ever lived this world. So when I explain this to you know some people, even some few colleagues, they understand it immediately. Mm. And Yes, nobody ever lived this world. So it means like to the spoon. Like you can imagine sci-fi films. You know yeah. what I'm So it means to the spoon, to the jacket, to the clothes, yeah. to the cars, to the bed sheets, to the pillowcases, to the pen, to the colors on the wall, to the handle, door handles, you know, to the books, to the cutleries. You make them all. Yeah. So have you, you had see how... any of this experience? Like, have you done any futuristic film? Yeah, yes, I've done, and um, yes, I've done some fictions like that. Um, yes, so there is one movie that is called um, and the, the Jablata. You know, like I hope I'm correct, Jablata. Yeah, so I think we were shot it like four years ago. Yes, so it has quite a lot of sci-fi in it. So this is like, you know, people living in, in underwater. Yeah. So it's more like, you know, mm -hmm, yeah. So people living in underwater. So you understand? So they, so I, I, I think, yes, yes, I've done something like that. Yeah. yeah. And there is a movie too. I may not say it's a futuristic movie, but um, um, a soldier story. Yeah. A soldier story, like, is a soldier story one is like the setting. You understand? Like, mm. it's not, it, there's no time. It's not set anywhere. So it's like, you know, we don't know where these people are from. You know, I kept on asking this question and we tried, I tried as much as possible to make the director place a place mm. on these people. So he said, no. Yeah, I remember Frank Yoga. So he yeah. said, no, that, the, the, you know, like somewhere in, somewhere in Liberia, towards the border of Sierra Leone, and you know, so that makes it very difficult, you know. So it makes it super, super difficult because you don't even know how to approach it. This is not your country. Yeah. We are not even talking about somewhere in Ijebode or somewhere in Portacot, you understand? Yeah. So it means you have to create that. Like, I remember I created a window, we built a set, and it was like, no, I don't like this window. You understand? I don't like the regular window. You know? And I'm like, wow. So we have to make a window. Mm -hmm. Started coming up with pictures. So he saw one, he said, Okay, yeah, I like this one. Let's make this kind of window. Making that kind of window, I did not have the machines. I did not have the machines. I did not have the machines to make them. You know, understand? So, but we tried. It took me like three days, me and uh, me and my construction team, you know, to come up with that kind of window because it, it has a lot of depths and holes and everything. Yeah. So we did it manually. You know, so 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 you can understand, you know, the difficulty behind, you know, shooting genres like that. Yeah. Okay. So, I mean, you've worked on a number of films from films and series from Lost Cafe, Road to Yesterday, Eagle's Wings, Crime and Justice, Lahira, Um, With all these films, like, 
which um one was particularly challenging and you know which one had so maybe like it could be like a particular prop or a location that you had to um kind of create for one of these films which one was the most rewarding and you know challenging for you okay the most rewarding and challenging are they two different questions or like is there anyone that's you know giving me both yeah anyone that's giving me both so the most rewarding to me is like till date will still be 76 yeah yeah, 76 will always be, you know, the most rewarding. Now, it has rewarded me in, you know, in so many aspects, you know. So, and because 76, you know, was successful. You understand? Yeah. So, but the most challenging, yes, I can still say 76, but then I can now put ego wings in there where I got to build, I think, um, I got to build like a crashed, you know, fighter jet. Yeah. Yes, so that was, you know, really, really, really challenging because I have never, you know, gone that far in construction at that point. Yeah. You know, so, but when it, when the challenge came, I picked it up, you know. So I was the one that even suggested it. So when I was making that suggestion in my head, I was like, do you have the capacity to do that? You understand? And so to yeah. build a fighter that what we did was we traveled, I requested that we travel to Medugri and um, to see the fighter jets that we are replicating. Yeah. And unfortunately that on that fateful day they said the fighter jet had left Kaduna to Medugri and and it's not coming back anytime soon because the fighter jet definitely will be going to combat you know the Boko Haram you understand mm. so and I needed to see it. So you know we spoke about it we went back to the office we spoke about it and I told them that that's the only way you know, I cannot, you know, do that by seeing a mere picture. Yeah. They told us to come over and do that. So that was really, really challenging. So for me to fly to, you know, the battleground yeah. <laughs> wasn't funny at all. So even the fighter jet that took me there, the fighter jet that took me there was like, you know, when you have Keke Napep running on the express. Yeah. Yo, it was crazy. Like it was really crazy. The wind was crazy. The turbulence and everything. So, and this thing, I was just inside. It was like you know, it was like a cartoon. Yeah. So it was really crazy. So I not to call it. So, so I think those were actually one of the most challenging moments in my in my career. You know. So I went there. You know, I took the measurement. You know, I saw it, the materials that I was going to use, and everything. Now compared to the budget that was given to me. Yeah. You know. So I I felt like you know. Can I pull this off? You know, so what I thank God, you know, with my team, you know, I had a great team and we went back, we started planning, you know, we're talking about it, you know, and, you know, and when we built it, like it took us like almost two weeks, you know, to build. So when we built it and we took it to the site and we crashed it, you know, like we didn't fly it actually. So yeah. we had to stimulate, you know, crashing and, you know, when it came out, you know, people came out and I was taking pictures and even some of the, some of the uniform men were like, you know, what is this? What's going on here? You know, because we had to create, you know, flame in the air. Mm. That's not, yeah. So it was very, very believable. So, you know, when we got good recommendation from, you know, the, the, the men in uniform, you know, and they told us that it's exactly how a plane will crash. I mean, so I really enjoyed that. Yeah. 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 Okay. So can you mention one movie or TV series that if you were stuck on an island, you'd be happy to keep rewatching? For me, I have like, it's not, I'm not a serious person. As in, like, I'm very, very bad. Like I, if you ask me if I've ever, till today, I've not finished Prison Break. You can imagine how yeah. backward I am. No. So I don't think there's any series I've watched up to episode three or four. You understand? So I'm very, yeah. very bad because for me, like when I'm watching movie, I try to, you know, highlight, you know, some key moments. You know, some production designers came meant, you know. So that's what I do. So I feel like when I watch episode one, two, three, it's enough for me. You know, I'm very bad at that. You know? So but movie, I have two. I can say three. You no, know, I have Black Panther. Okay. Black Panther one. Even the two is not bad. You understand? So I can watch Black Panther 18 times a day. Like what about it? Um, do you love? Yes, Black Panther, because Black Panther. 
has always been like I facilitate workshops. So and I use Black Panther a lot to teach. Because yeah. Black Panther has something very, very unique like in it. Like I've seen quite a lot of, you know, African stories being told by, you know, being told by foreigner, you know, like, but it has never, you know, it has never touched me or got to me like the way Black Panther did. And the reason is because I can see my culture being, being, you know, being transformed or being put on a global level, Yeah, you know, like where the whole world can see and can appreciate genuinely you know i studied how did the production designer you know you know pull this off you know so i began to see that he actually played with quite a lot of elements he didn't really care you know how you know what is obtainable you know because when you watch black panther you as an african man you would want to point one or two things but that's not how it works yeah you know so i think he was able to you know try to something yes yes into something you know relatable to even the western world yeah. Yeah. So when you look at the costume, you look at the cuts. So you cannot say uh, Black Panther is a sci-fi movie. You understand? So you cannot not also say Black Panther is a period piece. So you don't just know where to place Black Panther as a matter of fact. You understand? So you just say it's an action, you know, thriller. Yeah. But then you look at the how rich it is in culture. You understand? And so we're talking about one of the most, you know, overlooked you know, culture in the world, which is the, you know, Africans, you understand? understand? So, you know, for me, it's like, you know, it's like magic. Yeah. How did you do this? You know, like, you know, on a good day, you expect failure, you understand? You expect like total failure because I know the kind of risks, you know, putting an African story, African story on, you know, on, on the global, you know, platform. Yeah. So after making my analysis, I discovered that, you know, like, you know, how, he managed to use like some fabrics, beads, fabrics, or the colors on the wall. So, yeah. but then when you now look at the cuts, like for example, even the Black Panther suit, when you look at all these things, you'll be like, you know, of course we don't cut our, our, our wears like that, you know? So he was able to, you know, he was able to blend, it was like, like a fruit juice kind mm. of like. So after making a fruit juice, you can't say, okay, you, can, you, know, you can't place it anywhere. So you just know that this thing is so sweet. Now I'm just taking it. So, but it's a mixture of, you know, banana, hey, hey, you know, banana. I mean, so everybody can drink, you know, fruit juice, you understand? Yeah. So, but you cannot say, okay, you understand, this is only banana. Or this is only, you know, that's what Black Panther is to me. Like, it's so, so, so dear to me. I don't joke with that, with, with that project at all. Yeah. Kudos to all the people that worked on the project. Yeah. yeah, definitely. You know, the Nigeria film industry, you know, keeps getting more audacious with what, um, the kind of projects that they um, make for you, like what is something that you feel the industry needs to improve on? I must confess that um, it's improved over time. Yes, um, I must confess that it was terrible in the past. You know, it was really, really, really terrible. So um, before I answer the question, um, should I come, should I, coming from production designer point of view or like the general overview like of how it is you can briefly give an overview and then you can give the production designer's point of view i think respect for people's crafts respect for the the, the crew i think that's something that is you know improving but it's not there yet yeah. and i think it's affecting the whole system so yes, I I wouldn't want to go into the whole budget, and that's where everybody likes to, you know, <laughs> pinpoint. You know, that's where everybody that's what everybody wants to talk about the budget that we use. You know, the budget that um, is being given, the budget that is available. You know, the budget of our movies. You know, they're not like the holy. Of course, it can never get to the Hollywood if you know we don't respect each other's crafts. You understand? If you say Nollywood is not, you know, Nollywood is not up to the standard of Hollywood. Yes, but it's for a reason. Let's take out the markets. I don't know, you know, like I don't want to go into the marketing and, and the whole production thing, but from what I am saying in my own, you know, in my own understanding is we don't have respect for each other, each other's crafts. So a situation where the money man or the money woman 
feels I, I don't know if you get you know who, who the people I'm referring to as the money man and the money woman. Yeah. EP producer. Yeah. So the money man exactly. So the money man and the money woman feels like, you know, I'm just going to get, you know, a bunch of, you know, unemployed people, you know, on my projects and and tell them what to do. Yeah. You know. So it's affecting the whole system to me, you understand? So I remember I used to be in that shoe, you know, for so long. At some point, I said, no, you know, like, you know, there are things that happen in Africa when you try to kick against something, you would surely be seen as a rebel, you understand? And yeah. these things happen everywhere. It's not just in the entertainment industry. So when you raise a voice, when you try to make a voice for a lot of people suffering from, you know, one particular thing, you will become the rebel. So you're not seen as a hero. So even the ones you're raising the voice for will see you as a rebel because they are going to be brainwashed. They are also going to be brainwashed, you know, and they will be like, they will start seeing you as a big rebel. So who sent you making voice for us, you know? So this is the problem, like respect. That's just the only word I can use now, respect, you know, in general overview, you know, so I can give you an example when I say respect. It means like, you know, they know, some, somebody know what you earn. And at the end of the day, it's not as if the money is not there. But this person feels like, I beg, why I go pay this person, you know, so so amount. If he cannot accept this amount, let him go. You understand? So that's being disrespectful mm. to me in my own understanding. You understand? So even if you're going to make an offer that is substandard, at least... There's a way approach matters a lot. There's a way you approach this person and this, this person will feel important yeah. and feel like, like, yeah, you really need me. I'm going to give you a clear example. This one happened like last week, last week. Yeah. So I hope if the, if the person listens to this, you, yeah, he will understand that I'm referring to him. Over time, like, I, I worked with this pollution company and we became friends. We became, you know, we started having good relationship and they felt like, okay, Maybe on the next project we might have to get in somebody else. I don't have a problem with that. You understand? Working with somebody, we're working with another hand. I don't have a problem with that. But in a situation where you call the first person, this person comes on your project due to one thing or the other, still the same respect I'm talking about. This person doesn't get it. This person feels like, man, I'm not supposed to be on this project and leave the project. And you now go to call somebody else again, and this person comes again. It's still the same problem then that's when you now feel like let me now call in Chima. You understand? Yeah. I personally, over time, has never enjoyed that. You understand? So if you have a vision, you should have somebody in mind that you feel like, wait, this is the person that I will tell the story. You understand? So when you now call me, so, you know, to call the long story short, so this person called me on the project and I already... You know, I had the information that two people had rejected the job already. You understand? So yeah. when they called me and I said, no, I'm sorry, I'm not going to pick up this job. I know the reason why you want me on your project. I was very plain. He said, tell me, why do I want you on this project? I said, you don't want me to come and help you tell the story. What you want me to come and do is to help you salvage the situation. So where was I before? Why didn't you call me? Yeah. When, if you feel like I can help you tell the story, you know, so... You know, so this is like this is not even the real example I should be using. Now there are other examples where somebody will finish working, you're not paying this person. Six months you've not paid this person. The, yeah. This person is calling, you're not picking up your calls. You know, like what what can be you know disrespectful more than this? You understand? Yeah. So then you call this person up again for another project. You've not even paid up the first one. Yeah, and you'll be like, oh, how now? How are you doing? I'm fine. So I'm calling you because there's another project. You'll be like, really? What happened to my what happened to the last money? You know, I, there's no respect. You understand? So it's like seeing crew like this are a bunch of unemployed, you know, guys that need help. Yeah. I'm not gonna lie to you, like it happens. Like if everybody is not talking, me, I will talk. Like, so I don't accept that either. You understand? And I try to talk to my colleagues, like, let's not live our lives like this. Yeah, you understand? Oh, hey. So that one is by the way. Then you know, like if I'm coming from production designer's point of view, I feel like it's growing and I feel like I'm enjoying it more better than 
the way it was two years ago, three years ago, yeah. where people, the people who are employing you do not understand your job decision. Yeah. The people who are, so you can imagine employing someone and you don't even know what this person is coming to offer you. You understand? So it becomes very, 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 very annoying that when you now come on set and you're trying to, you feel in your head you're doing the right thing and somebody is walking up to you just because he or she gives you a job and start giving you a command. And if you don't obey, you're out. You know? So it's like, I felt like we needed, you know, knowledge, you know, stand. I, I felt like the people, even the employers needs the knowledge even more than the person you're employing, more than production designers. So if you don't have the knowledge of how production designers work, how are we supposed to work? You understand? So we so okay. Now let me tell you something about you know something that cuts across something that an, an event that happened that you know I can say cuts across these two um, these two examples. Someone employed me, you know, a production house. Uh, like when I came on set, you know, I was like, okay, now I think the best thing to do is to have a meeting with the director. And they're like, you don't need to talk to the director. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, why don't I talk to the director? I said, because the director is not available for you. So please give us quotation right there and then. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, it doesn't work that way. I'm sorry. He said, what do you mean it doesn't work that way? What do you mean? If you don't want to work, then you leave it. You know? And I'm like, you know, I had to control myself because I'm also human. And I stood up and I said, okay, I, I, I don't think we can work together. I'm sorry. He said, okay, it's fine. It's okay. It's not a problem. You know? So after like one week, they called me up again. He said, please, uh, I, I know you did best for us. I beg, if you give us contact of somebody else, if you don't want to work for us, can you give us, you know, like it's so annoying. Like there's no respect. No, nobody yeah. respects anybody. So how do we want to grow? Yeah. Yeah. So it's like, you know, we, I've seen some independent filmmakers, you know, getting a commission project from, from Netflix, African Magic. And at the end of the day, they call you up and say, oh, hey, Chima, I want you on this job. Okay, fine. Um, but this is how much I have for you. So no bargain, nothing. This is how much I have for you. And ridiculous yeah. amounts that you can't even pay. You can't even pay a PA. You are paying, you want to pay a production designer on a commission project from Showmax. Mm. That's that. So even the job that I'm working on recently, and I hope that the producers will forgive me if they hear it finally. You know, like I told them, it's a Showmax um, original. And I'm like, okay, that's right. you can't pay me this amount because it's a show marks original. And like, I can bend, I can work on any projects. Like, trust me, I do more low budget than big, than, than big budgets, you understand? Yeah. So, but I bend a lot. But when you're calling me for a show marks original, this money is ridiculous. You can't be saying you want to pay me 250000 for a show marks original. Mm -hmm. It's not going to work. I'm sorry. Yeah. They called me after a week and said, okay, let's negotiate. How much do you want? I told them, they said they, said they can't pay for some amount. Okay, but well, okay, how much can you pay me? They called down that ridiculous amount and it stalled again. After one week, they called me again. And this project had has a date already, a principal photography date, as in like principal shoot date that shoot more starts. You understand? We were, we were still going back and forth over a production designer who is your number two or, num or number one that you on number two or number three that you hire. Yeah. Now he's the last person you're hiring. You understand? So I don't know if you get know what I'm saying. I so guess. now the people who exactly so the people who are also commissioning this job to you guys are not stupid. When they hear how much you're paying, when they hear how much you're paying your crew, the next time they want to commission a project to you, they are going to give you a ridiculous amount too. So you see where the whole respect thing is coming from. That like when you understand, if I don't explain it this way, you will not understand it clearly. Yeah. When you don't respect people, you don't pay them the money you're supposed to pay them. How then you want do you want them to improve on their craft? How then do you want your own client to release more budget to you when they hear these people crying? When you come next time, you think they will hear their cries and give you more money? No. The, the Western world is not stupid. Mm. You understand? So it's like, it's like that. To me, I feel like this is it. So it's so emotional. That's why I said I, I can't use two minutes to even explain it. You understand? Mm. So because we've seen a lot, you know, like, and at the same time, we're talking about a production design or art department that gives so much. The the, what, what they bring to the table is so immense. Mm. 
and they are usually the last person you call to come and work on a project. The last person you offer money at, and they are like this kind of people, like if you take it or leave it kind of deal. Yeah. Anywhere you go, is take it or leave it, take it or leave it, take it or leave it, take it or leave it. You don't respect me. Mm. So I think um, this is a major factor. Let's not talk about the budget. So something is affecting the budget. You understand? Know so let's not go into that budget. When you ask a producer, director, or whoever, they keep telling you the budget, the budget, the budget. But what is the problem? You understand? When yeah. we don't respect each other, how do we get more budget? You understand? So to me, this is my own point of view anyway. So I know a lot of people disagree. I know I've even, you know, had quite a lot of banter. I've had quite a lot of, you know, discussion. We've been on the round table, we discussed this. This is, I still stand by it. Yeah. When we respect each other, the industry will grow. Yeah, definitely. Okay, um, so Chima, how can people keep up with, you know, all this impressive stuff you're doing on movies? Do you have somewhere where you post your work? Yeah, but you know, because of my craft, you know, you, you don't post too much, you know. So, so you don't post too much. Um, I don't know. Like sometimes I try to see, you know, the most celebrated production designer and see what he or she has posted or has been up to. You know, so I don't know. I think it's like a culture that the production designers don't post too much. Number one, and the reason again maybe because we don't have the right to most of these things. Yeah. You know, at the early stage, you know, so you cannot follow us because we can't even put anything up. We don't, we sign contracts, you understand, a non disclosure agreement. So that alone does not make us post. So, but me, I try to post, you know, movies that has been, you know, done and dusted, you know, like, so if you go to my page, you see, you know, old projects. I don't really post new projects. You can follow my work, you know, on Instagram, yeah. you know, you know, Chima underscore temple. Okay. Uh, thanks, Chima, for coming on the Niger Filmmaker. Yeah, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Yeah, it's my pleasure to be here. We have come to the end of this episode. Remember to rate and review the podcast. You can also follow me on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook at Selegal Film and the podcast at the Niger Film Pod to share your feedback. You can now support the podcast by visiting the website to donate. See you on the next episode. Have a good one.